What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com, part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined today by Andy McCullough of The Athletic, here to talk about the Dodgers, Clayton Kershaw, and of course, a new book that he's got coming out next spring. Andy, I appreciate you joining us. Middle of September, the stretch run is upon us. Are you ready for it? Jeff, there's nowhere I'd rather be than getting on a flight to Los Angeles in a few weeks to go cover the postseason out there. There we go. Yeah, the, the, you know, it's got to be of, of all the places that you could potentially travel for the postseason. Southern California has got to be the best, right? Um, Well, I live in New York, so taking like the four train to Yankee Stadium is slightly more convenient. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it'll be fun. I mean, I, you know, obviously I still um, have, you know, I, I used to cover the Dodgers uh, for a while and I'm not around the team as much anymore, but um, it'll that's my assignment for this coming postseason. So I'm looking forward to, you know, being back in L.A., seeing Dylan Hernandez, Dave Vesse, all the sites. It'll be great. Awesome. Well, hey, I want to get to the book, like I said, that you've got coming out about Clayton Kershaw. But first, let me get a couple questions in just about the current state of the Dodgers. Yeah. A bizarre team. I mean, you mentioned it. You're a guy that that was a beat writer covering this team. You've obviously, as a national writer since then been been following the Dodgers fairly closely because they've been a national story just about every year. Is this one of the weirdest Dodger teams that you can remember just because of the state of the pitching staff as we currently sit yeah, here? Yeah, very unsettled, obviously. Uh, I think, you know, the – uh, it's unclear what will happen with Julio Urias just because, you know, we have due process and all these things, but the team appears like pretty – sounds pretty unlikely they expect him to pitch again for them this season. Yeah. You know, he's on admin leave and uh, any sort of suspension would knock him out for um, the postseason. That's, you know, frankly, his availability is the, the less important part of the story if, you know, the um, – sort of the, the what he was arrested for is proven to be true um you know be the second time and so that's something that you know takes precedent over how it affects the Dodgers rotation anyway um but yeah I mean with Urias out with Walker Bueller shut down with Clayton Kershaw um appearing to be operating at a diminished physical capacity you know yeah. uh you're talking about you know rolling out Vasse's guy Bobby Ice in Game One of the of the postseason, which is not how they drew it up. But yeah, I mean, I think that it looks like they are going to be patchwork pitching all the way through with openers and bulk guys, and you know, a lot of Dave Roberts pressing a lot of buttons, uh, which you know can work, obviously, um, but it's not how you draw it up and it's not the way the team looked when they went into the postseason last year or in 2020 or, you know, I'm 2021. I'm trying to remember. They seemed like they were still pretty set. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't know if I've, I can ever recall a season where they you, you're going in being like, who is going to start game one? And yeah. Wait, who is going to start game two? Okay. Pepio. Is he healthy? Okay. You know, it's yeah. But they're also like going to win like 95 to 100 games again, yeah. right? Can't be stopped. Yeah, yeah. I think as we sit here, they're actually on pace for like 99 wins, which yeah. is a ridiculous number. And I mean, but to your point, there's not there's a far greater than 0% chance that the Dodgers could start Bobby Miller, Ryan Pepio, and Emmett Sheehan in three games of a postseason because we don't know what Kershaw's health is. Right. And, you know, obviously Lance Lind lingering. Uh, if you want to go down that road, I prefer sure. not to go down that road based on what we've seen. I wouldn't mind like, starting Lance Lynn in a postseason game. I Like, really, I understand He's going to give up a couple bombs, but he's also Lance Lynn. He's been quite a good pitcher for a good, for a long time. I, I I wouldn't feel terrible about asking Lance Lynn to take down five innings. Okay, that's that. I mean, it's an interesting take just because of the way. I mean, this, the the concerning thing with him lately is just the lack of bats that he's been missing. Yeah. It's like you know when he came over, he was giving up home runs, but striking out seven or eight guys. I think he's right. got like two or three strikeouts in his last few starts. So. That's the concerning piece, but I mean, who knows? The Dodgers have all sorts of questions they need to answer. I do want to ask you, from your perspective, as a guy who is in the process of writing a book about Clayton Kershaw, it's obvious that, to your point, he's not healthy. I mean, Dave Roberts has openly said it. I think Kershaw has stubbornly refused to say he out loud. He feels fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. We know the velocity's down. Uh, the performance is down. I've said, Andy, that if there's anybody – that can figure out how to reinvent himself in three or four weeks in order to become an effective pitcher, given the state of his shoulder, 
that it might be him. I mean, we did a thing on his pitch mix and he's throwing more changeups than he's ever thrown in his career. The last couple of starts, which is just bizarre for a guy that's never needed it. And it's almost like, all right, well, I don't have the fastball. We've got to figure something out from the, from, from where you sit, what sort of confidence do you have in Clayton Kershaw being able to figure something out if his shoulder doesn't miraculously get healed in the next few weeks? Uh, well, I don't know if it's a matter of, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a matter of figuring things out. I mean, I think it's a matter of being healthy enough to execute. I mean, Clayton yeah. Kershaw has succeeded in the major leagues for 16 years, kind of doing the same thing. Yeah. Like there are variations and he's changed it up a little bit as time has gone on and fiddled with the knobs. But for the most part, what he does is throw like uh, glove side fastballs down with the slider off it. And he throws generally throws to the same quadrant over and over and over and over again. And so, yeah, he's been throwing more changeups. Um, you know, the pitch looks like a guy kind of still trying to learn a changeup at 35. Uh, he's been throwing the curveball more, but the curveball looks like a pitch that, as it has for 20 years, for one that he has never had a great feel for throwing a strike for it's always kind of hit or miss um and he's really always been relying on the fastball and the slider and when there's less of a differentiation between the two whether it's you know because the fastball the view like the fastball still seems to have the carry that uh that is so necessary for him because one of the misnomers about kershaw is like he has kind of like a mediocre fastball because of its velocity yeah um if you talk to like hitters like they'll tell you like it's the best fastball they've ever seen, especially wow. in, in his prime. And it's because of some of the characteristics of it, just the, it has like a vertical rise to it. That is very deceptive. That's why he, uh, especially in his prime would get so many like bad contact on just middle, middle balls. Um, he still has some of that carry to it. He's still able to get behind the baseball, but it seems like hitters are seeing the slider better. Um, whether it's because the velo is down a little bit and the movement is uh, a little more apparent and all that stuff. So, I don't think it's a matter of like, do I think he could just like learn a change up in three weeks? No, I don't. He's been trying to learn a change up for, for 20 years. You know, I think what the Dodgers have to hope for and he has to hope for is that he can get his shoulder to a place and get his body to a place where he's able to do the things that he's always done. And the Dodgers are able to manage him in a way where he can get through you know, maybe it's maybe it's just two turns through the order. I mean, yeah. you know, you know, maybe it's just four or five innings. Maybe it's six if he's going really well. But just, you know, you saw it like against the D-backs two starts ago, right? Like yeah. his stuff was not there. His command was not there. And he went five innings and gave up one run because yeah. he tends to try and challenge people in the zone. He, you know, outcompetes everyone, all that stuff. So I think if he's able to get into a physical place where – you know, he can repeat his delivery and, you know, hide the slider a little bit. You know, you can hope that he can he can still be effective. I mean, he still has like a two something ERA this yeah. year. Um, that being said, do you feel good about him facing the Braves? Not really. But then does any pitcher feel good facing yeah. this version of the Braves? Like, no. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of I don't know. That was a long answer, but. Um, no. And I mean, like to the to your point, like what I've always said when we've had conversations on our show is what's the alternative? Like we could sit here and, and point to Kershaw's flaws and the velocity and all that. But if you're the Dodgers, it we're having we're having a real conversation like Dodgers fans are having a real conversation of if I needed to win a game tomorrow and my life depended on it, would I rather have Clayton Kershaw or Emmett Sheehan on the mound? Like that's a real yeah, conversation. Just, yeah, that's crazy. You should you would take you're crazy if you don't take Clayton Kershaw on that. However, like. The, the more concerning thing, like he walked five guys yeah. in his last time out. You know, that's not what he did. That's a sign that there's something, totally. you know, awry there. He does not walk five guys, especially, you know, he's facing the Marlins. Um, so, yeah, and then they gave him, you know, another kind of like 10 days in between starts to just see if he can, you know, d clear out whatever it is is affecting, you know, the where the shoulder is. But, you know, he's 35 years old. He's, you know, he's pushed his body to the limit um you know it's it's a tough spot but if, in terms of like competing in terms of the will to be out there yeah you have to if you're the Dodgers you have to feel good 
about giving him the baseball. I think it's just a matter of just physically if he could do it. Well, and that's like the last question I wanted to ask you is as somebody who has been around the organization of the Dodgers and knows some of the key decision makers, I think they're going to be tasked with a really interesting set of questions for themselves come postseason time because, you know, we're saying, hey, if Kershaw can get his shoulder healthy, I mean, we're sitting here talking about this in the middle of September and the postseason starts in like two or three weeks. Shoulders don't typically get yeah. dramatically better in two or three weeks. Right. And so realistically, the Dodgers probably will be making a decision that if Kershaw can can survive the next two or three weeks and still be a viable option, they're going to be looking at veteran guys like Clayton Kershaw, who's battling shoulder injuries, Lance Lynn, who is in the worst stretch of the time in the Dodgers, which is admittedly not a, a, a whole lot, or these young pitchers, Ryan right. Pepper, who's been incredible, Bobby Miller, who's got all the stuff, uh, Emmett Sheehan, you know, Gavin Stone, Michael Grove, fill in the blank. And we know what the Dodgers MO is. It's Kershaw game one, Lance Lynn game two. Like that's what everybody would expect them to do because hmm. the veteran, they, they tend to defer to veteran guys and, and come postseason time. It feels like they usually keep the training wheels on the young guys. Walker Bueller, I would say is maybe the exception to that, but it feels like from a performance perspective, they're going to be pressured to maybe go with a bunch of young guys. Like, do you think, I mean, well, you know, I, feel like what you're, I feel like what you're talking about, though, is just the way they use Tony Gonsolin. And I think that they use Tony Gonsolin very specific to how they felt about Tony Gonsolin. It was okay. very clear the Dodgers did not believe Tony Gonsolin was trustworthy after 75 pitches. Yeah. That, you know, and I don't know if they put Bobby Miller in that same category. You know, okay. I don't, it's not, I'm not saying Bobby Miller is the second coming of Walker Bueller, but I think they see him as a guy who could be a front of the rotation type um, okay. you know and I think they will probably have a I, I don't for you know they were using like Dustin May in a opener role however many yeah. years ago before you know all the arm troubles yeah, yeah you know but that was more a product of his age and stuff like that and how built up he was and the fact that it was the weird COVID season like I, I yeah. like I'm not like are they gonna probably put an opener in front of Pepio in one of these games? Yeah, like they can't help themselves. They you know they 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 love it, right? They're addicted yeah. to it. Um, but I think that they will I think you just kind of have to use your roster. Like you just kind of yeah. gotta play your team. And if that means like trusting, you know, Pepio for five innings when maybe you know they want to trust him for three, like I, yeah. I don't know, but these are all decisions like you're gonna they'll have to make them if they get deep enough to even make them right. Like they're, yeah. they're at a, they're in a stage where like every game is kind of going to be a five alarm fire. It feels like unless they've got someone on the mound who they trust and like, who actually is that? I don't know. Yeah. Like I, and you know, and, and Kershaw fits in that bucket where it's like, if you can get five innings out of him, yeah. you might just have to be like, Hey, this was great. And I think, you know, I, he probably, would not be thrilled to leave after, you know, five scoreless innings, but probably, yeah. you know, I think everyone recognizes like where he's at physically right now. It's, it's, yeah. you're, you're kind of taking what you can get. I, I genuinely think the 2023 Dodgers postseason, depending on how long they last is going to be like this incredible baseball experiment where we've seen teams throw like two normal starting pitch starters. And then it's a bullpen game. Like genuinely the Dodgers could go opener and piggyback every single time. Yeah. Like it could be, Kershaw and Pepio and then it's Bobby Miller and Ryan Yarborough and yep. then it's you know I mean like legitimately they could that we could see a series where the Dodgers never get more than four innings from a single pitcher for an entire series and you could even make the case that that might be their best path forward like like yeah based on the personnel they have yeah I mean I think it just but that's kind of what I get back to like you got to play your roster yeah. and so I think if you try and the thing that they have struggled with is so nice way to put it in recent years is overly scripting how yeah. games should go. And I think when you have a staff that is this limited, that feels like a recipe for disaster, but yeah. yet you also really do have to script it out because yeah. you don't have a Walker Bueller coming through there. You know, you don't have Hunjin Ryu. You don't have, you know, 2017 Clayton Kershaw. You don't have Rich Hill. You don't have the guys that you can really trust in the rotation. So I don't know. It's going to be like, uh, you know, it's seen in Apollo 13 where they dump all the stuff on the table and say, build an air filtration system. You know, that's good. It's just, they dump all that stuff in front of Dave Roberts and they're like, Hey, win the world series.
Yeah, and there's and nothing. And Dodger yeah. fans, Dodger fans are going to be thrilled to hear that Dave Roberts gets handed a pile of stuff and says, "Go figure it out." Oh man, yeah, I, Dave <laughs> takes a little too much criticism. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. One fun stat, by the way, since August first, the Dodgers, as a staff, starters and relievers combined, have the best ERA in Major League Baseball, which is yeah. a pretty fascinating stat when you think about the yeah. guys, the guys <laughs> involved. Yeah, I mean, they look, they're going to win close to 100 games with a just a completely, you know, foobar pitching staff. Yeah. You know, and some of that is just, hey, you employ Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman, and that covers up a lot of problems. But also, like, they do a lot of things well as an organization. Okay, I got to ask you one more question, because you just mentioned Mookie Betts, and I realized I was talking to a guy who's who's not in the L.A. bubble mm. that, that I am typically in. Uh, give me your thoughts on Acuna versus Betts for the MVP. Oh, uh, I don't vote for the awards. Okay. Uh, so I don't pay as much attention as the voters do. Uh, is Mookie ahead in war right now? By a right? lot. Yeah. Then I'll vote for Mookie. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fair. I mean, to me, it's that I'm, I'm with you, but it's an interesting, it'll but be an interesting. A, yeah. But if Acuna wins and he yeah. has a 40, 70 season, whatever. Cool. Good. Yeah. You know, I it's, it's, I mean, war is a junk stat. They're all junk stats, you know, like who knows? Like, um, I think, I think they're both very deserving. Uh, I think the MVP debates are uh, like, it's a fun debate, but it's sort of like you either one is very, is a very deserving candidate. Acuna is yeah. like awesome. Mookie's awesome. You know, whoever yeah. wins, I, I don't know. I would, I would assume Acuna is going to win. Cause he's kind of got like the narrative totally. wind beneath his wings. Um, you know, it's kind of, cause like sometimes I feel it is a narrative based award. Like, like Aaron judge won last year over, Shohei Otani when like most teams will tell you like Shohei Otani is like much more valuable yeah. than or that version of Shohei Otani is much more valuable than Aaron Judge but it was kind of like Aaron Judge's season you know yeah. like in the way that the year before was kind of Otani's season like he was the guy that everyone was talking about and this year has kind of been Acuna's season season you know he's like kind of been you know he's doing stuff that hasn't been seen before and um he's having a you know he's the best player on the best team and so yeah. Um, from a narrative perspective, you know, I think there's might be enough of a war gap where Mookie still should get it, but Acuna, I don't know, who knows? They could win the World Series and he could retire. They could lose in the first round and he could, you know, sign with the Texas Rangers. You know, there's 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 no, three options that. on You're the table. You're not allowed to say that out loud on this show, Andy. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. one thing that's banned from being spoken out loud. Yeah, yeah. There's there's three options on the table, right? Yeah. And um, you know, those, they've been the same three options for a few years, and so, you know. I get the sense that he hasn't decided either way. And some of it's going to depend on how his body responds over the next few weeks. But in some ways, like kind of the, he's already like, he's already like made the, the journey in a yeah. lot of ways, you know, and yeah. that's kind of what the book is is about. Yeah. There's nothing that could really happen that would dramatically change the outcome of, of kind of the, the narrative. Um, I, I do want to, I mean, do you like, do you think Clayton Kershaw is, incredibly serious about potentially pitching for the Rangers or do you think it means enough to him to to want to retire as as a Dodge like like would he go to the Rangers only if the Dodgers didn't want him back and he wasn't ready to to finish or do you think there's a real value to him in going and pitching in Texas well I think his his desire to be with his family is very sure. very real very sure. real um especially you know we get into this in the book but knowing how he he grew up um, you know, his, his childhood, he very much wants to be present in his, in his children's lives. Yeah. And that is an ongoing, um, sort of logistical puzzle that the family deals with, you know, sure. um, just, you know, they, he, he and his wife have a rule that, you know, they can't be apart. He can't be apart from the family more than like a week to 10 days. Um, okay. you know, he finds when he's home, in LA pitching and the family's back in Texas to be just incredibly challenging for him, yeah, you know? I get it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, but I think there's also like all of the, you know, the, the, you know, but that feeling lasts for a week and then the <laughs> yeah. family comes out or then the summer starts and school lets out and the kids are, are there, you know, um, yeah. they're still at an age where like he's not missing significant milestones. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's hard for him when, you know, one of his sons is playing his first soccer game and he's not there, you know, it's, yeah. and, and that's something that he might have the opportunity to do if he's in Texas. And so, um, you know, and he is very like he's 
very close with, you know, with Chris Young, the Rangers yeah. general manager. You know, they went to the same high school. They've been friends for, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, I don't I think they both don't want their friendship to kind of get sullied by like a, you know, by salary yeah. negotiations, you know, that type of thing. But like, yeah, there's a real I don't I, I've, I always feel like going to the Rangers is the least likely option of yeah. the three. But I don't think it's I think it's a real thing. Yeah. OK, last question. Um, as I was prepping for this, I was reminding myself that I mentioned this to you right before. And you already knew this. But among guys who have thrown fifteen hundred or more innings in their career since 1920, Clayton Kershaw has the lowest ERA of any pitcher in Major League. Um, and there's only one other guy who's pitched in the last 20 years who's even in the top 30 of that list. That's Pedro Martinez. He's 15th. Um, about a half run. I mean, literally a half run worse than Clayton Kershaw career ERA wise. Do you feel like Clayton Kershaw is appropriately appreciated by major league baseball fans? Like I, I feel like hmm. to, to a Dodger fan, I'm biased. So it's, of course he's the best pitcher of his generation and one of the best pitchers of all time. Yeah. But I do feel like nationally there would be people that say, well, you know, Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer, some other guys in the generation that it feel like are, are even in the conversation when t- in a lot of statistical measures, there's not really a conversation to be had. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I do think that there is more to it than just ERA. I mean, totally, and, I think, totally. and I think Verlander's ability to uh, maintain this pace, oh, yeah. this deep into his career is something worth, uh, totally. you know, worth noting as being pretty impressive. The way, I, the way I, with those three guys, I always feel like um, at the end of the day, um, Kershaw had the best peak. Scherzer had the longest peak and Verlander's going to finish with the most counting stats, all yeah. that stuff, you know, the most wins, the most strikeouts, you know, the most war. Um, but Kershaw's the only one who fans care about. I yeah. mean, it, yeah. it, not that, not that fans don't care about those other guys, but Kershaw's the only one who has been the central figure of the postseason. He's the only one who, they would do a segment about on first take, uh, you know, he, so how do I, f- I don't know. I, you know, I like, I think the best pitcher of all time is Randy Johnson. It feels like, but you know, Randy Johnson also had seasons where like he had a four ERA and walked nine guys per nine, you know? Um, yeah. You know, I know just in the course of this book, I mean, Madison Bumgarner says he's the best pitcher of all time, you know, like, uh, like, Bumgarner says Kershaw is the best pitcher of all time. Kershaw Sorry. Is the best it was very believable that Bumgarner was saying that he was the greatest. Pitcher oh, of all no, time. no, no. Well, that I would be cool. Yeah. Sure I, I will say Bumgarner did something awesome uh, when I was talking to him. We were talking just about the uh, the the 2014 World Series. And uh, and I mentioned something just about how, you know, he pitched four innings in relief. And he just looks at me and he goes. <laughs> he just holds up a hand five. He's like, ah, that was awesome. Uh, but yeah, like Bumgarner says, you know, Kershaw is the best pitcher of all time. You know, Garrett uh-huh. Cole says he's the best lefty of all time. You know, uh, Zach Greinke says, you know, he, he thinks the highest of Kershaw of anyone he's ever played with, you know. Um, and that to me, I think, you know, some of it's obviously recency bias for these guys. Yeah. But I think the way that their peers talk about them matters. Yeah. You know, uh, almost because the stats are fungible and like, I do think that one thing, one thing about Kershaw that you appreciate when you watch him, uh, a lot. And one thing that like Brandon McCarthy talks about a little bit in this book is this idea that like, he has a inherent skill for run prevention mm-hmm. that I don't know if like, it, it's kind of hard to, you just have to watch like, yeah. He, he, him, McCarthy and Granke would like sit in the dugout and Kershaw would like give up a single and then he'd walk the next batter and he would just immediately get a double play. Yeah. Like next pitch double play, you know, after he's like all over the place walking the guy and they would just be like, is it magic? Like, is it get, like, how does he, he just had a single, he has a singular ability to get people out. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's a hard thing to, explain if you don't watch it i think he's someone you appreciate more as you watch because he's not a guy who shows up on pitching ninja you know he's not a guy who sets velocity records he's just kind of the best person at 
pitching. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it, I, I think of the last, you know, whatever, 25 years. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. We've got stats like expected ERA and Kershaw's outperformed his expected ERA in seven of the last nine seasons. Yeah. So, and again, I mean, that's, you know, just to bring it full circle as we're watching 2023 Kershaw with a broken down shoulder, it's hilarious for me because I've been sitting and having conversations comparing Kershaw to Bobby Miller or Emmett Sheehan. And people are like, well, you know, the stuff of Bobby Miller and the stuff of Sheehan. I'm like, no disrespect. Bobby Miller's given up four, four and five runs in three of his last four starts. Kershaw, even at this diminished, yeah. he gave up three earned runs in five innings in his last. He had given up yeah. one earned run in the four before. I mean, and and I know like as a guy who believes in numbers and metrics, there is something to, hey, that doesn't feel repeatable. But there's something about Kershaw that I think, you know, Brandon McCarthy seems to have put his finger on. He just always outperforms that this doesn't make sense metric. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think think about <clears throat> think about what he had to do in the World Series against the Tampa Bay Rays when Manny Margot is stealing home. Crazy. Right. He has to see that. He has to step off and not balk, and he has to like make an accurate throw. And this is a play that they've like never pra- they don't practice. Right. Like it's just he has to have the the presence and the muscle memory and all that to do that in a in a situation right where he's like blowing a three run lead, yeah. right? Like he's given up two runs. They're 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 knocking on the door, and he has to be able to have the like the composure and the wherewithal to execute those physical things that most people would just like, you'd probably yeah. just balk, right? Yeah. Very few people get thrown out stealing home. They do it because they know they're going to get there. Um, and it's, it's that sort of, you know, the uh, John McPhee talked about it with Bill Bradley, like a sense of where you are. Like Kershaw has that he has the, you know, if he's able to get to a place physically, where he can execute at any sort of level approaching, you know, who he is yeah. as a pitcher. Like, yeah, you have, yes, you trust him more than Emma Sheehan. Yeah. You know, and that's not to knock Emma Sheehan. It's because this guy has, you know, 90 grade compete, a hundred grade, com- you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like not even 80, like above that. Like that's his only, he probably might've had like a 75 fastball. I don't know. But like his, his only 80 tool is compete. Yeah. Which is not even a tool, really. It's just like, you know what I mean? Like, and so that I think is something that probably gets lost if you don't watch every fifth day. Yeah. Well, Andy, I appreciate the time. Again, folks, the book coming out, you can pre order it now. The Last of His Kind, a book about Clayton Kershaw by Andy McCullough, senior writer over at The Athletic. Andy, thanks again for your time. I can't wait for this book to come out. We'll have to have you back on in a few months once the uh, once you finished writing it <laughs> off the publishing and and once you're promoting it because it's out we'll have to have you back on yeah we'll see uh we'll see how this uh finishes up but yeah it should be fun thank you so much awesome. for having me i appreciate it awesome well thanks everybody for joining us as always uh we appreciate your time enjoy the rest of your day folks and of course go dodgers